Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for our event this morning on assessing the economic and financial dynamics of a cross-strait crisis. Um, I want to also welcome my colleague, Gerard DePippo, um, who is a senior fellow at the economics program. Uh, also should explain the somewhat odd setup here where I am in uh, Rockville, Maryland uh, at my house and everyone else is in person. This is not any sort of factional struggle at CSIS, uh, but we're dealing with a sick kid this morning. But uh, thanks to the wizardry of our AV team, I can still participate uh, in the discussion. So this is part of a, uh, um, this work and the discussion this morning is part of an ongoing research stream that Gerard and I have been working on over the last six or so months, where we've been trying to understand with more granularity how markets, financial markets, um, or economies, uh, technology supply chains, shipping and logistics would be impacted by various scenarios in and around the Taiwan Strait. So we've been holding closed door scenario planning exercises with companies and investors where we've been testing out a range of possible trajectories and, and discrete individual uh, scenarios to gauge how, um, how firms would be reacting and responding, um, what would be their assessment of how markets would respond, uh, whether that's um, equity markets, whether that's commodity markets, what are their expectations for the actions of uh, governments in and around these scenarios? And then we've been trying to pull these together in some um, overall uh, analysis that we've been putting out and, and will be putting out in the future. Um, so this morning is, is part of that discussion, and we're really uh, delighted to have brought together a, a group of experts who look at this from various different um, lenses. So we're joined by Anna Ashton, who's a director of China Corporate Affairs in US China at the Eurasia Group. Uh, and folks will know Anna's work as a, as a longtime analyst of US China relations and, and China's uh, political and economic system. John Fagan, who's a principal and co-founder at Markets Policy Partners. Uh, and John had the misfortune of attending one of our scenario planning uh, exercises, um, but we're still on speaking terms and really <laughs> delighted to have him join us this, mor this morning, uh, and Emily Kilcrease, who is a senior fellow and director of energy, economics, and security program at the Center for uh, New American Security, or, or CNAS, um, which is a frenemy think tank of us at CSIS. <laughs> but um, Emily, as, as folks I'm sure who read Foreign Affairs, uh, War on the Rocks, and other publications will know is doing just excellent work in thinking about how technology supply chains, technology choke points, um, how they operate, why they matter, and in this case, this morning, to talk about how um, these will be impacted by various Taiwan scenarios. So the, the game plan is for the next um, 56 minutes, we're going to engage in a, a roundtable discussion, trying to think through some of these issues at starting at the macro level to understand how how firms, um, how companies, how investors, um, uh, how supply chains would be impacted by various cross-strait um, tensions and scenarios, um, how these rising tensions, both in the Taiwan Strait, but more broadly US-China, um, are affecting firm decision-making, whether that's tactical decisions about how they structure their supply chains to more strategic decisions about how might firms think about shaping and shifting strategy over the near and long term in, in light of these rising uh, tensions. And I should also say one of the things we're, we're doing with this research and we hope to do with the discussion this morning is also nudge the conversation to the left of um, thinking about um, invasion scenarios, which are real and important and can never be ruled out, but also um, are only one of the problems or potential problems that, that um, we might be facing. and. There are, there are higher probability events that could occur in and around the Taiwan Strait that would result in significant economic and financial and technological disruptions. So we'd like to explore those um, a bit as well. So with that, we'll, we'll dig into the conversation. Um, I'm going to moderate the first few minutes of, of the panel, and then I will uh, turn it over to Gerard to um, uh, mix my metaphors, take us over the finish line and stick the landing, um, hopefully. 
So I'd like to just go around the horn and start with a, a series of, of broad macro questions, but just to help orient us. And I think the first is, if you're working at a, you know, if you work for a technology firm, if you work for a multinational corporation, if you work for a, a global investor, you, you probably know the economic and financial stakes of a, uh, of a crisis or, or rising tensions in and around the, the Taiwan Strait. But I might like to ask um, the panelists to help orient those of us who, who aren't working for an MNC or an investor. Can you set the stage about why tensions or a crisis in the Taiwan Strait matters to the United States more, more broadly? And, and Emily, I might start with you. You know, you look at a really critical part of this uh, challenge, which is about technology, technology supply chains. Can you, so can you just orient the viewer of why is the Taiwan Strait, Taiwan, mainland China, why are these critical arenas for uh, thinking about global technology supply chains, whether that's my PlayStation 5, uh, cell phones, or, or really everything that powers the, the modern economy. Yeah, thanks, Jude, and thanks to, to both you and Gerard for convening us this morning. It's a really important conversation and, and one that we're doing quite a bit of work on at, at CNAS as well. You know, it's, I think to set the table here, it's important to realize that when we talk about disruptions to supply chains in this general region, we're not talking about any good options. We're talking about bad, worse, and catastrophic uh, you know, outcomes here, even short of a full invasion. Um, and, and folks who follow this space will know that a large part of why that is is because of the criticality of the chip supply chain in Taiwan specifically. So just to rattle off the stats that many people are probably familiar with, TSMC in Taiwan produces over 90% of the world's cutting edge chips, the chips that are in your phone, that power modern electronics, et cetera. They also play a really critical role in legacy chips. Um, you know, in some, some types of chips, it's over half the world's supply, right? So any sort of disruption to the physical movement of those chips out of Taiwan could have really significant impacts, not just for the chip sector, although clearly it would have impacts on the chip sector and that whole ecosystem, but then you have to think about where are those chips going ultimately. They're going into your computers, they're going into your electronics, they're going into your coffee maker. Some of these things we care about more than others, um, but when you talk about the scale of that sort of disruption, all of a sudden you're putting the entire digital economy at risk. So when we're thinking about the economic consequences, we have to think about the direct impacts of disruptions in those supply chains, as well as the second and third order consequences if it's disrupting, for example, the automotive industry, which requires chips, if it's disrupting our ability to do telework or to have lovely things like Jude's head joining us virtually, <laughs> these are things we cannot do um, without the supply of chips. I would also note what we learned during the pandemic is that even small disruptions can have a really large ripple effect. If you shut down a fab, it's not like you turn a switch and then it comes back online immediately. That fab is out for a couple of months until it get restarted. Similarly, when you're talking about the physical movement of goods, if you stop one ship, all of a sudden the entire system gets clogged and it takes months to unwind that. Um, so even in a, a, a scenario where it's short of a full invasion, if you have those disruptions, the ripple effects on the physical movement of goods and particularly chips um, could be pretty significant. We're talking trillions of dollars worth of impacts likely. And it is that experience uh, with the pandemic where you know investors, I'll, I'll speak to investors uh, specifically, just are so much more sensitized to the, uh, to the impact and, and supply chain problems. The way it manifested itself in this truly you know, stagflationary aspect where prices shot up uh, and availability was limited, but at the same time was a drag on growth. It was something that obviously you know, monetary policymakers are still struggling with uh, to, to sort out the ramifications of this. So it really is you know, much more front and center in people's minds. Yep. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the same question to you, please. Sure, I, I was just going to add that um, reiterating the points that have already been made, really, um, I think it's, it's easy, especially for those of us who are lay people when it comes to the tech space to think that uh, the semiconductor industry is uh, one that is fundamentally specialized and only affects uh, you know, a limited number of goods, but, but the reality is that it affects you know, every kind of good that you can possibly think of almost. Um, you know, cars, everything green energy because semiconductor chips are essential to converting the power uh, to the grid for uh, electric vehicles and other things. Um, computers, of course, and phones and gaming systems, but also 
durable household goods. Um, so the, the spillover effects of supply chain disruptions um, in this arena are, are kind of unlimited. Actually, Jude, can I just make one more point to bring in the, the Chinese mainland on this, that uh, the number one export destination for Taiwan semiconductors is actually China. Mm -hmm. And that's because China makes a lot of things. It's by far the world's leading manufacturer. But it, it's also like 40% of world exports of ICT and electronic products, right? And then you add Taiwan on top of that, and it gets even higher. So in other words, it's not just a question of re the world's reliance on Taiwan for chips. It's Taiwan making the chips, which then largely go to China, which then go to the rest of the world. So it's all interconnected. You can't, you can't just sort of take Taiwan out of the equation and then expect the rest of the world to work fine. It's actually linked to the mainland. Gerard, actually, if I can put a question to you as a follow-up too, can you also orient how important the Taiwan Strait as a maritime transport corridor as well? So if, even if we take the, the technology sort of chip portion out of this, if we were to see, you know, in a crisis, a, a massive disruption of, of sh uh, logistics, shipping, even, whether uh, air or maritime, can you just give the, the audience just a sense of how important that is, um, even just again for, for furniture and, and food. Yeah, I mean, b because of the dominance of China as a manufacturer, and then they're obviously Chinese ports, a huge share of the world's tonnage of consumer goods and, and other things are shipped through the Taiwan Strait. I've seen numbers like 80 plus percent of those types of goods. The thing to keep in mind though is that that's, that's just because it's the fastest route. Rerouting around Taiwan is not necessarily a huge deal. It's not, you know, it's not a giant island. The bigger issue is that, is there, and this we'll get to later, is the scenarios under which this becomes a concern is that there are ports, uh, basically all of Taiwan's ports are on the west coast of Taiwan, and then a lot of, at least six major Chinese ports are, let's say, well within flight range of Taiwan. Uh, and so if there is a scenario where the strait is compromised, let's say, in, you know, a blockade or a conflict, uh, it's not just that there's maritime traffic disrupted, it's that there's no ability to export those ships from Taiwan and a lot of the production from China is then going to be disrupted as well. Emily, I want to now go to you, you know, I want to go around the horn again. I think um, uh, everyone at the table has been having discussions with, you know, over the past year or so with investors, with, with companies um, to try to understand how firms are, are thinking about uh, various risks. I wonder for, for all three of you in the broader uh, set of conversations that you've been having with private sector actors, and of course, John, you, you are in the private sector, but um, how has thinking about Taiwan risks changed over the last 12 months, both in light of the invasion of Ukraine, which seemed to have you know, caused a few uh, you know, tectonic plates to slip, but also you had the, the visit to Taiwan by Speaker McCarthy, or excuse me, Fortean slip by Speaker mm -hmm. Pelosi uh, last August and the resulting military exercises. Um, we'll get to some other dynamics of U.S.-China tensions and, and internal China changes later. But just in terms of Taiwan-related risks, how different is it now in terms of MNC firm thinking in March 2023 versus where it was in, let's say, February 2022? Yeah, I think there's no question that firms that have exposure to China are significantly more worried about a Taiwan scenario than they were a year or two ago. They're also concerned about the broader geopolitical risk about operating in, in China. And in some respects, it's hard to disentangle the two. How we've seen them respond is varied, and I think it depends on the type of firm that we're talking about. Advanced technology firms have been on the receiving end of a lot of uh, U.S. government encouragement and direction to start moving supply chains. So they've already had to think about this, right? Either because legally some of their exports or operations in China are no longer permitted through export controls and that sort of thing, or they just see the direction that policy is going in. Um, but I think the distinction between this broader geopolitical risk and the Taiwan scenario is the sense of urgency um, and how much companies are willing to put in the resources to really reconstitute some of those key supply chains outside of China. And I specifically am saying reconstitute because I think we often say shift supply chains as if you can kind of take the whole supply chain and just kind of pick it up and move it over. And that's just not how supply chains work, right? Especially when you're talking about China's manufacturing capacity. I think people like to talk about the, the Apple statistic where when Apple first got into China, less than 10% of the value of the iPhone came from value add in China. Now it's somewhere around 25%, which just shows how integrated uh, that ecosystem is. 
um, and how dependent most companies are on the entirety of the capacity within China in order for the business to, to succeed and to grow. And reconstituting those same sorts of ecosystems outside of China, outside of China is costly and it's going to be a really time consuming endeavor. And so I think we're starting to see companies do a China plus one strategy. They're starting to hedge. They're starting to think about it, do strategic planning and move some operations outside of China. What I don't think we've seen yet, um, unless others around the table have, is the level of action that you would actually need companies to take if tomorrow there was um, one of these scenarios that we're talking about, if or even in a year or two, like we are, the, the U.S. multinationals are essentially toast. If in a year or two we have these sorts of scenarios where the physical movement of goods is is jeopardized, we haven't even started talking about sanctions yet. So I think awareness, strategic thinking, planning, but we still have a long way to go. Emily, can I just ask a quick follow up, which is mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of discussion on decoupling from China, although you just put some, you just drizzled some reality on, on what that would look like, you know, functionally and how hard that is. As concerns over sort of broader uh, geopolitical risks are rising in the region, but also very specifically thinking about cross-strait tensions, do you sense that any companies are starting to talk about diversifying away from Taiwan? Um, I mean, that is the entirety of the Chips and Science Act, um, really, <laughs> when you think about chip supply chains, at least. Uh, but it's a question of diversification, not replacement, right? Like, we're never going to replace, for example, Taiwan and TSMC's role. It's about building redundancies and option B and C into your long-term strategic planning. Um, so I don't think there's any realistic plan that involves getting away from Taiwan, nor, nor from a strategic perspective, would we want companies going in that direction, right? I mean, I think there's a bit of a deterrent effect of... TSMC being in Taiwan, the Silicon Shield, et cetera. John, question to you ab about just how, you know, um, inside the pen of, of investors and you're in the startup, you know, up to your neck in the startup universe now, can I ask you how, what, what different conversations are you hearing in March 29th, 2023 than you were hearing, let's say in, in February, January of last year about Taiwan? Yeah, no question. I agree with what, uh, what Emily said about the, just the, the sensitivity the fact that this, you know, potentially something unthinkable happening, well, we've seen the unthinkable become almost routine over the past few years, unfortunately. And the invasion, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, really, you can, uh, you can see that as a, as a clear demarcation point where investors began to take this risk, you know, substantially more seriously and actually, you know, try to envision a world and envision what they would need to do in their portfolio uh, to account for something that, you know, whether invasion or other uh, blockade and so forth, some other accident uh, potentially in the Straits. But, you know, with, as, as with, is typical with investors, you know, when you're looking at something that is a, you know, an unknowable timing, you know, low, probably a low probability, <laughs> let's hope it's a low probability, but exceptionally high impact kind of event, it's very difficult to orient your portfolio to account for that. Insurance and hedging is expensive. It's a drag on your performance. And you know, where would you hedge? Obviously, you know, if you look across the asset classes that are you know, most directly uh, on the firing line for, uh, for a, um, a blow up in the Straits, well, then you'd look at you know, a higher plane of volatility for the Taiwan dollar. That has happened and basically coincided with, um, with the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but you know, when you look around, you know, the rest of the region, you know, are Taiwan, are Taiwanese equities really, you know, sporting any sort of specific kind of discount, or you know, uh, because of this risk, it doesn't. It's very hard to tease that out. It's very hard to see, you know, and especially when you have a situation like, uh, you know, exposure to Chinese equities, uh, you know, where does the Taiwan risk figure in that? Uh, and essentially. The more immediate risks are, you know, Beijing's common prosperity, the private sector issues that uh, that they've uh, that they've wrapped into this policy, and uh, and certainly the, you know, the give and take between the <laughs> the private sector and uh, and Beijing is not by any means over. Investors have certainly uh, responded to that, responded to the ongoing U.S.-China frictions uh, and the tightening of you know whether it's blacklists um, and uh, and the chip embargoes and so forth. These are, you know, more immediate, more immediate considerations when you're uh, positioning in your portfolio. But, you know, with the, the risk being, you know, clearly more real in people's minds that this could happen, I think that uh, investors are, you know, doing a lot more, doing a lot more investigating into what kind of playbook they, you know, they could possibly 
orient their portfolio with in, uh, in that kind of a scenario. Gerard, I wonder to, if I could actually just ask you to, okay. to build on what John was just saying, because can you, I wonder if you could give some stylized uh, summaries of some of the discussions we've been having. You know, yesterday in our discussion where we ran, ran one of these, I was surprised by in the investor portion of that, um, everyone was where John was, which is, it's basically domestic Chinese regulatory and political behavior that is incentivizing discussions of decoupling, diversification, you know, China is uninvestable. It didn't seem like the Taiwan scenarios were really the most salient factor in shaping investor strategy. Is, is that what you're thinking as well? Yeah, I mean, I wish, I don't know if polling on this exists, but it would be great to have such a poll that would look at different types of investors or firms and what are their, their like ordinal ranking of concerns. My sense is that sort of for short to medium term plan, uh, planning, it's not it's not Taiwan crisis. It's actually uncertainty about the regulatory environment in, in China, uncertainty about U.S.-China political uh, direction or things like export controls. Um, it's it's uh, the effects of China's erratic COVID policies last year, China's alignment with uh, with Russia in, in its war against Ukraine. Um, I think it's it's hard to, Emily already said, it, it's actually hard to disentangle this, right? Because like it's all part of the same risk. But I think from, from a planning perspective, um, what you do about those individual risks is different. So if you're worried about tech regulations in China specifically, then you might just reduce exposure to that sector. If you're worried about the worst case scenario with Taiwan, it's like a binary event, and how do you how do you price that in, or even can it be priced in? And so we'll get to this later, but I think it really depends on, on what type of firm or investor you're, you're talking about. Right, and the investors yeah. themselves, you know, when you have an investment, you know, if you're, for instance, because of the regulatory environment, you're ex you're reducing exposure to Chinese tech companies. In the back of your mind, that you can say, also this gives me some coverage for some sort of unknowable, unquantifiable. Taiwan risk yeah. as well. And so you can have, you know, kind of your positioning. I like gold for these other reasons, but boy, gold would also do well in a really bad, uh, you know, US China, I mean, China Taiwan um, spasm. Right. So, uh, so these, you know, parts of your portfolio can do double duty and, uh, and, and account for those risks, uh, at least to some, you know, modest degree. Anna, um, I wonder if you can give us a, a a broad spectrum overview of how, how clients are talking. So I, I, if I can put aside for a second what we were just talking about, the sort of blurred kind of broader macro geopolitical concerns, just, just to sort of uh, narrow down specifically to Taiwan for a second. Um, over the past year or so, how have MNCs that you've been engaged with, what new sorts of questions are they asking now? And put put the put the dial to the appropriate volume of alarm on Taiwan scenarios for, broadly speaking, for, for MNCs? Is it, has it gone from a two to an eight, um, or is it just notched up from a two to a four? So I think that, uh, by and large, clients are not uh, overly worried that uh, a military conflict is going to happen in the near to medium term, uh, but they're much more worried than they used to be. and. Uh, I'm sorry to do this because I know you were trying to get it away from the macro, but I think that the macro is important in the sense that um, what uh, one of the major consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as the, the COVID pandemic, is that um, companies more and more are realizing that they have to factor in major geopolitical issues, the macro picture. Um, they can't just think about their own industry sector and, um, and you know, how to strategize to succeed vis-a-vis -vis their direct competitors within that sector. They have to think about these other factors that may shape the environment in ways that, that aren't as easily foreseeable um, because the Russia-Ukraine invasion wasn't foreseen by many people. The COVID pandemic wasn't either. Um, so when they talk to us about Taiwan, they certainly, you know, frequently want to check in on what our base case is, how likely we think a conflict is and when, uh, what's driving it, and then they want to know what other companies are doing and they're talking about diversifying, um, not, not leaving China, but diversifying investments so that their overall global revenue is, is less dependent on China. Um, they're talking about uh, things like whether or not they have to have a, an exit strategy where they have to consider cutting losses if there is an event uh, 
uh, like a military conflict, and then you know the repercussions in China are that you know their their operations are nationalized or they can't get their capital out. Um, but I don't think that very many of them are super far down the road when it comes to planning for these things. And again, that's because um, as of now, Eurasia Group, for instance says that the risk of a military conflict between now and the end of 2024 is 10%. Um, it's much more likely that we're gonna have uh, one of these uh, less than a military conflict, serious security scenarios, whether that is a quarantine or blockade because of increased military exercises or some sort of cyber event. Um, <clears throat> and those also require planning, but I think the, the sheer unknowability of exactly which of these buckets of things they might face makes it very difficult to do that planning. Um, Anna, you have so expertly segued to uh, me handing it over to Gerard, who's going to ask precisely about what some of these non-invasion scenarios might look like. So I want to thank you for, for the Vulcan mind melds that, uh, <laughs> that we just did there. So Gerard, over to you. Yeah, well, let's just keep going with that. So what, putting aside the extreme of the far right, let's say, is, is like full-blown conflict. Maybe one inch to the left of that is something like a blockade, which could quickly escalate to something worse. But go further to the left of that. What, what are actual plausible or, let's say, much more probable scenarios that could have effects for, for investors and for markets? And, and uh, ask, ask you that, Anna. And then, John, I'll ask you, uh, what do we actually see in terms of the, the actual market response uh, when, when Pelosi went to Taiwan? So I think the, the interesting thing about plausible scenarios, I don't think a blockade is, is implausible, especially not if it's uh, de facto and um, not long term. You know, a full on explicit blockade may be implausible, but uh, a blockade brought about by military exercises in response to something like um, President Tsai coming to California um, to speak at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Uh, and meet with, with the person who's third in line to the presidency, um, that could seriously disrupt shipping, right? Disrupt global supply chains. Um, and I think it's important to uh, kind of shine the spotlight on the US role in all of this risk, because uh, as you said, Gerard, you know, there are lots of risks that are emanating from, from China, uh, but US responses to China, US perceptions of China, um, U.S. rhetoric around China is also uh, escalating risk. You know, right after Russia invaded Ukraine last year, there were congressional hearings um, about about Taiwan and the you know how a Taiwan scenario might play out, where um, U.S. banks were brought to testify and asked point blank to clarify whether or not they planned to leave the China market in the event of a conflict over Taiwan. Um, really put on the spot. So I think that a lot of the planning has to do with, with watching Congress and wondering uh, who's going to be the next president and what, pres what that president uh, might do in terms of the direction of the relationship. So that's another great segue, which is that you know, often it's, we're assuming that the, the mover, the first actor, is China, but actually it can be the U.S. as well. So taking the case of the Pelosi visit, that was a decision that Speaker, then Speaker Pelosi made. What, what did you observe, John, in terms of market response and maybe before and during uh, the visit? Yeah, it was a pretty standard sort of risk aversion event, right? It was, you know, essentially <clears throat> the equities coming under pressure, uh, feeling some sense of relief, uh, you know, when the worst case scenarios or, you know, serious, uh, a serious rupture in, uh, in the diplomatic relationship didn't uh, materialize. Uh, you know, you t typically get, you know, equities in the equities in China and Taiwan falling. You would have, you know, flight to safety treasuries, the dollar. Uh, you'd see some modest weakness or moderate weakness in this case in uh, renminbi and Taiwan dollar. All of these are, you know, accompanied by other hallmarks of uh, sort of a generalized risk averse scenario because of this is such an encompassing relationship it's so large and its ramifications of this are so wide reaching it's hard to you know look at anything you know that wouldn't be touched by uh, some risks around this but when it blew over you could see a very you know swift rebound a setback you know it didn't seem to create a lasting 
um, headwind to some of these assets and you know these more immediate concerns, more immediate issues, whether it's COVID zero, whether it's regulatory environment, take the reins again for uh, directing asset prices. Now, surely, investors, you know, looking at uh, looking at this region and looking at the severity of some of the reactions can be, you can't always take, you know, Chinese, for instance, the renminbi uh, price action at face value. Um, the Taiwan dollar is a very stabilized and sort of stage managed currency. It doesn't have, you know, big, you know, hold, it doesn't have dollar bonds and, you know, big foreign holdings uh, the way that, uh, that some, you know, Taiwan doesn't have this, these components that can, you know, create not just vulnerabilities, but can create avenues for expression for your price action and investors that you can see more clearly. Um, and, uh, and so that's something to, something to note, which is, you know, some of these signals of building stress to the extent that we, you know, are potentially going back into a heightened risk scenario sometime in the future. Some of these early warning signs that you might see in markets under other, you know, in other areas might be more muffled in the case of like China, Taiwan, because of the way that those markets are, you know, stage managed, as I said, or at least, you know, stabilized to some degree just by policy fiat. So this is a comment and then a question. So uh, my comment is um, I had been thinking, this is something Jude and I were talking about yesterday, actually in response to the, the session we had done yesterday on these topics. I had been thinking, look, there's a whole range of scenarios and the discourse both in DC but maybe in boardrooms and, and amongst investors is too focused on the tail end risk because that's actually not the most probable. There's a whole range of things that are much more probable. But then what's, what's dawned on me uh, is that actually what matters for some types of firms, not everyone, it might not matter as much for hedge funds who have short term outlooks, is where where along that spectrum, how far to the left do you have to go that the probability of that event pushing us back to the right uh, is no longer the base case? In other words, like ultimately in the case of the Pelosi visit, right, what markets were responding to was the fear that it was going to escalate into something worse. The visit itself is not what mattered. It's what it signaled about what was happening going forward. And so my totally unfair question, uh, and I wish we could, we could get a really good answer to this, is like how far to the left or maybe what what factors should we consider when moving to the left in scenarios when uh, the question is like how much do these things actually matter in terms of market effects like, or if you're a firm how much you need to worry like if, if the side visit which you've already mentioned right that's a real thing that's going to happen very soon how worried should firms be like how how much at what point do, are we just going to the left where it's just sort of a, a market blip and it just recovers does that make sense? I don't know if that's even a fair question, but uh, I, I wish we could quantify that with some model, like a decision <laughs> tree, right? Yeah. I, I'll take a stab at this, but I feel like it's, it's in many ways Emily's territory more so than mine. Um, so I'll pass it over to you. But, um, you know, I think that it is, it is totally sound to argue that Tsai coming to the United States to meet with McCarthy is uh, likely to be less provocative than McCarthy going to Taiwan, and uh, that's backed up by the reports that the Taiwan government is, is uh, the player that initiated the decision right. to have Tsai come here instead. But it is also important to remember that it was this kind of visit in the 90s that precipitated the third Taiwan Strait crisis, um, that China already overnight has warned about a, a response to this visit, and so we probably will see some sort of military exercise, show of force that will be disruptive to shipping, disruptive to supply chains. We're not sure for how long or to what degree. Um, I think the bigger issue here, though, is that um, China's sort of modus operandi in the region is to continue to um, engage in these gray zone activities where it's difficult to say um, that they are preparing to do the worst. Um, and so it's difficult to know exactly how to react, and it's also difficult to, uh, to estimate how a U.S. action or reaction, what kind of response it's going to provoke from China, which is why we need people like Emily who are thinking about those, those specific things. 
I'm like, can you give us a, a detailed <laughs> map of probabilities of the range uh, of this? I'm not committing to that, but um, you know, one thing, um, I mean, this is obviously a question we're thinking a lot about too, and I think one thing to look for is when either side is doing something that they haven't done before in kind of a tit for tat scenario. Um, and what we haven't talked about yet really is how sanctions would play into any of these scenarios. And I think that's really important. We've gotten into um, a little bit of familiarity with the use of export controls and entity list designations. When the balloon flew over the United States, you know, our response was to put a whole bunch of, I think, six companies on the entity list. And that was kind of seen as, yep, that's what we do, right? Like, that's the response. But what we haven't really done is financial sanctions at scale, with very good reason, right? I mean, once we start going up that part of an escalation ladder, the consequences to the global economy and the backlash to the US economy could be severe. And we have shown a remarkable amount of restraint so far in using financial sanctions, SDN designations, really kicking Chinese actors out of the global financial plumbing. We do it sometimes around human rights. We've done it for Iran. We just had a, a paper come out at CN, provides the numbers on this, but we don't really go after the basic plumbing of the Chinese financial system. So that's one thing that I would look for is how we start to think about whether and when and under what circumstances it may be appropriate to start thinking about those options. Because once we go there, then we're at an entirely different point in the escalation and China will respond to that. If we're able to show restraint and if it's appropriate to show restraint, then we're kind of coming back to the normal baseline to your question, Gerard. So I think a lot of this really depends on how these iterative dynamics play out and when we start to do things that we haven't done before when China starts to do things that it hasn't done before to kind of move that baseline further towards the more worrisome scenarios. And th those clearly escalatory moves, mm -hmm. and those would certainly get the attention of investors. Right. Um, the, but the way that investors have, you know, I guess it's a good thing, over the past few years, of course, as we've said, investors have positioned their portfolios for a lot more China risk, right? Mm -hmm. And that started with, you know, the U.S.-China fight. But, you know, to be fair, it's been going on for years. You know, Chinese markets have been very challenging to trade uh, with this bubble crash, bubble crash kind of dynamic, the 2016 uh, deflation scare in China and so forth. So, you know, progressively, the, uh, the investors have on the margin uh, priced in and, uh, and, you know, oriented their investments to a lot more bad news in China. So, mm -hmm. um, so at least it wouldn't be as big a shock necessarily. Um, but the reality is, unless those over escalatory moves are taken, investors are going to, you know, maybe brace for a little bit of play, a little headline risk around some of these kind of uh, these events uh, that are foreseeable. But on the other side of it, there's a presumption that, you know, you wouldn't really have a lasting portfolio, uh, you know, change uh, at that level to account for something that just is a blip. Um, and, uh, and you'd have to, you know, basically just revert to your, you know, revert to your assumption that the worst case scenario is not going to happen. So when we're ta trying to narrowly focus on concerns about Taiwan versus maybe U.S. China or China's internal environment or whatever, it seems, um, I'm glad, Emily, that you mentioned sanctions. So it seems to me that, that the two end states that are the primary risks slash fears are either physical disruption, which could be war, earthquake, or a range of things, anything that prevents you from getting access to what Taiwan makes primarily chips in terms of value added. Um, but the second is sanctions, right? And so you can imagine maybe a scenario where there are heavily disruptive sanctions that are not necessarily happening in the context of a full-blown disruption of trade. Uh, you know, our CSIS econ program is doing a, a, a series of, of uh, reports on this, looking at the potential use of sanctions mm -hmm. against China and Taiwan contingencies. Um, I'll ask you to speculate on, on the bottom line of that report months in advance for me, which <laughs> is that do you think it's plausible or investors, should they be worried about the, the, the possibility that the U.S. would use let's say draconian sanctions against major Chinese banks, something that would be heavily disruptive, short of the worst case scenario with say either a blockade or an actual war. Is that plausible? Um, I don't know that I would see us going in that direction, but I am hesitating a little bit because what we learned from the Russia context is even with all of the signaling and messaging about yeah. unity and resolve amongst the G7 economies, those sanctions did not have a deterrent effect and then we did not impose them until there was boots on the ground. I think our sense and I think the whole conversation we're having today reflects that 
with the Taiwan scenario, that clear signal of the bad thing just happened, therefore you go nuclear on sanctions, like we're just not going to have that binary decision point. And so there is this murky area um, where we're short of that. And then at what point do we start to climb the escalation ladder? And so I don't think that we would or should go to the very severe options like central bank sanctions unless and until there is like that invasion, right, or a serious blockade. But where I think you could potentially see action is lower down on the escalation scale. So say you start kicking one or two banks out of access to the New York Fed and foreign exchange operations. Is that a signal both to China in terms of the resolve and the willingness to take really serious actions, but also is that a signal to markets? And then how do markets respond to that sort of thing? If we're saying, yes, we are actually very serious about hitting the financial sector, China sees that, but then the markets see that and go, oh boy, right? Um, and then how do we kind of bring in that sort of um, that iterative dynamic again? And so I do think you may start to see some of those uh, smaller steps on the escalation ladder, but it'll be very stepwise because the objective will be not just to hit China and put that economic pressure on China, but to maintain the stability of the global economy because that is what will really kind of undermine and undercut a sanction strategy eventually is if you tip the entire global economy into a recession. And there's a very real risk of a maximal sanction scenario against China heading in that very severe direction. And Jared, sanctions... Jared, can I, yeah, can I ask Emily, I guess the group of follow-up is I'm curious um, from conversations you're, you're having and, and um, Anna, John, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on this as well. How, how is the private sector processing events in Ukraine Russia, Ukraine, and carrying those over. There seems to be a, on the one hand, you know, Emily, you just mentioned this um, a, a few minutes ago, but um, surprise at the, the extent and severity of the sanctions, even if they were sort of post-deterrent or post-bad event, it still seemed to have a holy cow lesson for many about the, the, the extent to which the United States and, and allies and partners were willing to go. On the other hand, I also hear many companies and investors say, rightly, well, you know, China's not Russia. Um, so those are, are not necessarily non-overlapping, but they seem to be two sort of slightly different conclusions. I'm curious, anyone who has um, hearing discussions amongst firms and investors, MNCs, about what are some of the stylized lessons companies are taking away? Do, do they now expect that the United States would, under the right scenario, go maximalist, or, or is the, the view Again, Russia is not China, and that puts a, a hard ceiling on even you know Emily, your your instance of taking a, a few Chinese banks out of the out of the you know United financial system, I think would be seen as an extraordinary move. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm just curious, any thoughts on how people think the private sector is interpreting lessons from Russia and how they might apply to China? I think it's hard for them to completely map the one context onto the other. I mean, on the one hand, firms are having a really hard time fully exiting and making sure that they're compliant with the Russia sanctions. And that's a much smaller economy, right? We're still talking to firms who are dealing with the, the after effects of, of those sanctions that were imposed a year ago in terms of compliance, in terms of the um, continued operational or financial ties that they have that they're trying to, to wrestle with. On the other hand, they look at a China scenario and they just don't see how the US could go there and go completely maximal in that sort of scenario because for Many of them, I've had some tell me that point blank, it's an existential risk for their company. They cannot operate um, and make any money or make any products more specifically if they don't have those supply chains in China, at least in the, the short term period as they're thinking about how to move it. And so I think there is this mixture of concern, but also disbelief that the US would go there and start to kill some of its own companies by taking sanctions moves um, that would have such a dramatic effect on US firms with that sort of exposure to, to China, whether it's direct impacts for their operations or broader kind of systemic impacts um, through a financial sector sanctions, which would have pressure across, across the system. I would just add, you know, I think <clears throat> clients uh, do expect that in a, in a worst case scenario, you know, with military conflicts between the United States and China because of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. First of all, I think there is an expectation um, which has been managed pretty forcefully by the Biden administration that the United States would get involved militarily if China were to invade Taiwan. Second, I think that there is an assumption that uh, the sanctions would go maximalist in that event. Um, but the gulf between uh, 
a maximalist sanction response and something short of a maximalist sanction response is pretty big. Um, how do you step up incrementally uh, from targeted sanctions to maximalist sanctions um, and do it in a meaningful way and, and, bring, and that requires bringing allies and partners along. Um, and it's also pretty clear that China's style is not to be that explicit or overt. So in the Russia context, um, you know, we think that uh, the United States won't go maximalist uh, in its secondary sanctions against China unless China is explicitly and overtly um, providing clear military, lethal military assistance, uh, which is pretty unlikely to happen at this stage. Um, and so what's the in-between, right? And I think um, Bonnie Lin did some interesting work on how this sort of stuff plays out and how you, how you plan for it. Um, talking about the pain tolerance of different countries and, and how hard it is to estimate the pain tolerance. I think um, there's probably a fair assumption on China's side that the United States has a limited pain tolerance when it comes to going maximalist with sanctions against China, and so does the rest of the world. Um, but even if the, the economic planners uh, who are involved in these decisions, even if the administration uh, to have uh, a limited pain tolerance and are worried about the implications of this. What about the politics? And I think the politics are a little bit harder to predict. Um, I think the United States could end up in a situation where the political pressure is for something more maximalist, kind of damn the torpedoes. Uh, and and that's, that's one worry that I have. One thing I'll just add on the sanctions discussion and try to use a limited time to, to pivots and other questions is that if, if we actually are talking about the worst case scenario where um, either as a precursor or maybe actually has already happened, where there's discussions like putting sanctions on the PBOC, for example, are seriously in play, it's also plausible that the physical disruptions are so severe or could be soon so severe that it's almost the same effect as the sanctions. In other words, if there actually is a full-blown conflict, whether they're sanctions or not is kind of a marginal question. It's more of like, okay, Taiwan is knocked out of the global economy. There are going to be massive supply chain disruptions regardless, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am I'm tempted to spend our remaining time talking about sanctions and their use or lack thereof as a deterrent, but there's a few other things I want to get to. Um, I want to be a little more granular as to how different types of financial investors versus multinational firms um, are thinking about or might respond to various crises with Taiwan. So, so John, I'll start with you on the financial side. So think, think like say from the perspective of a short-term uh, hedge fund, how might they react versus say a long only, you know, uh, asset manager? Yeah, obviously it's, it, the hedge fund will have a lot more degrees of freedom. And, you know, from a long only uh, fund, you know, you're just thinking batten down the hatches, right? You don't have that many levers necessarily to pull. If you're a global macro fund, you know, you've got more of a, you can't let the crisis go to waste. You have that potential to be, you know, short the markets and to actually profit off or at least, you know, protect the capital of your investors with some savvy moves and, and hedges and strategies and bets. And so, you know, the, in financial markets, of course, everybody knows that the incentive structure is to, you know, if you're going into, if there's a big crisis like the kind that we're talking about here, nobody is going to have you know, their investors rebel if they take a loss. Like losing money during the global financial crisis didn't you know, get you fired, right, essentially. And, uh, and so there is always this, you know, the incentive structure is to try to, you know, sell Armageddon, right? You, you sell that risk up until the last minute. For every Michael Burry, you know, they're the, uh, who's betting on the worst case outcome. Most others are, you know, just trying to get past it or, you know, trying to, you know, take the other side of it, uh, something that uh, that they see as, you know, potentially unthinkable or, or so forth. So it's it really is a uh, you have a lot more degrees of freedom in one of these funds. You also have, you know, long only. It's sort of a fait accompli. If you're at long only, you're going to lose money in it. But again, it's not necessarily the kind of like career threat. It's 
because everyone because else everyone is losing else money. is yeah. you know like when you were in the third grade and you said that about the teacher they can't punish all of us right, right? so that so what actually applies to investor thinking something that Jude and I have heard uh, is is that basically market this is especially true for financial investors that markets um, will or your your investors into your fund are much more likely to punish you for missing a rally than they are for missing Armageddon because everyone else would have missed it as well. A hundred percent. And you know, most of the funds that really got uh, got taken out by the global financial crisis were the because they missed the upswing in, in 2009. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. uh, and that that really more than you know the big drawdowns in 2008 forced you know investors in funds to redeem and, and move on Let, let's talk uh, more real economy so you know direct investors or those companies that are relying on Chinese supply chains how is there a way of putting them into buckets of how they might think about the risks and how they might respond to these scenarios well I certainly think that companies that are operating in sensitive sectors that are clearly identified as um, strategic national security related um, <laughs> like the semiconductor sector, uh, are, are, are more, I guess, more motivated to start taking actions to mitigate potential risks than some others. But all companies with operations in China are worried, not just about a Taiwan scenario, but just about the uncertainties of their future in China, given the um, continued decoupling trend, however slow it is, it's, it's certainly underway. Um, and so I think, you know, the reality is they know that there's not a lot that they can do overnight. If there were some uh, full blown crisis, it would involve them having to cut their losses to some extent. Um, they are already trying to mitigate risks by diversifying supply chains, by um, limiting the percentage of their global revenue that's coming from China, um, by thinking about uh, employees' vulnerability and how they would move employees out, um, other measures like that. But first of all, there's, uh, there's the reality that there are still business drivers that dictate being in China, um, big ones. And second of all, there are the limits that exist right now for um, trying to replicate what they have in China anywhere else. So uh, I, it's hard to imagine a situation where companies with operations on the ground can realistically be fully prepared for a crisis event because um, the business drivers up until that moment are going to still demand that they be in China probably. So this might be a crude way of separating it, but, but for direct investors, you could maybe buck them, bucket them into two kinds. One are those that are um, in China or have operations in China or have supply chains in China for the purpose of providing services or goods to the rest of the world, so mm. sort of in China for export, which was you know, probably most of the FDI going to China, say, 20 years ago. Right. But over the past decade, it's been much more in China for China, right? So that, that's a different situation because those are companies that need China for, it's not just supply chains, although it's not mutually exclusive, it's they need China for their source of revenue. And so if insofar as there's a discussion of pulling out, you're basically saying we're letting go of all that profit. Whereas if, if you're just sourcing something from China, maybe over time you can find alternative suppliers, right? right. If, if it's cost viable. Um, but but I, I mean, that's sort of how I've been thinking about it, right? It's like those, those two rough models. But then of course you have different types of companies, different sectors who might have different types of exposure. There might be some who have operations in China that are sort of fairly well siloed off whereas others are more deeply integrated into their global businesses. Um, so there's no, there's no one size fits all, I guess. Right. I Can I also yeah. just add that one of the things that has come out from our discussions is, is firms thinking about sort of real economy effects of various crises, but then also thinking about various reputational risks. And obviously that'll vary firm to firm if you're a, a big sort of marquee US brand where your brand name is a, is, is a part of your sort of value proposition. Um, uh, you might be thinking about the reputational factor, you know, at an elevated level rather than sort of Jude Blanchett Furniture Company, which, you know, which, which um, you know, uh, produces in China. Um, uh, and the other thing that's interesting is, um, aside from real economy effects, is not to bring this back to sanctions, but just to get the point out there, um, it, it's, I think, something that comes from our conversations is, although, of course, many firms don't like sanctions, Really, the threat of sanctions 
might be the only thing sort of especially to left of invasion scenarios the threat of, in, of sanctions or sanctions themselves might be really one of the only things to functionally um, get them to to move and that other than that they'll basically just you know uh, hold on tight white knuckle it and, and try to make it through it especially if china is a, a, an important market for them which i found interesting i, I suppose a priori, I would have assumed that firms might be taking more proactive steps to avoid some of these, even left of invasion scenarios that could be incredibly disruptive, or I would have thought have had a, uh, an impact on their uh, uh, reputational price. But it seems that, again, anecdotally from companies we've talked to, that many would just simply wait to see, um, uh, try to ride it out and, and wait to see if sanctions are coming down. Well, how much do reputational risks matter, or let me put it this way, under what scenarios would you imagine reputational risks being so severe such that a company actually would pull out of China? I mean, it's been said a thousand times, China's not Russia, right? So letting go of the Chinese market is much harder. And I'm thinking of examples like the NBA, where certain things have happened and there's been a lot of blowback here or from Congress. The NBA is still active in China. So like, I'm actually getting skeptical that reputational risk has all that much predictive power or it actually would drive firms. Do, and, do, and do we want it to, I guess, is yeah. the question too, right? Like, I think we want the NBA in China. I think we want McDonald's in China, right? Like, there's this whole soft power element that we haven't talked about yet, but is really important to think about. Um, and when you talk about, do we want to incentivize firms like McDonald's from getting out of China, then you are talking about broad scale decoupling. And I do not think that is in our interest, right? Like, I think when you see, we talk a lot about advanced technology firms, and there we do need to have a really serious conversation about getting away from the China market because of the contributions that those technologies can make to China's military modernization. I am not particularly concerned about Big Mac contributing to China's military modernization. I want those companies to stay in China unless and until there is this kind of catastrophic rupture. And so I think we need to keep that in mind as well. Like, we are not talking, and I am certainly not recommending at any point this broad decoupling, right? Like, there are strategic advantages to having those companies in there for the financial, economic, and soft power benefits, and we can't lose sight of that either. And that really tracks the way that the Biden administration has walked this line between, you know, targeting, mm -hmm. you know, the strategic aspects, the national security, uh, important elements, and you know, and basically targeting Beijing and the uh, President Xi and the party rather than the Chinese people. Yeah. And you know, that idea of, you know, we've got. We've got no problem with the Chinese people. We're, you know, looking at very specific uh, institutions, actors, and and the leadership, which I think is the right is the right thing to be saying, and it's the right thing for Congress to be saying too. But uh, one problem that I keep uh, pondering around that is that uh, I think built into that is an assumption that the Chinese people too think of themselves distinct as distinct from their government, um, and wouldn't react to um, to aggressive government action by the United States against the Chinese government um, in a nationalistic way, which just isn't true. I mean, the reality is that uh, for all of the issues that we can identify with the way that the Chinese government works, it has delivered uh, reliable improvements in prosperity and standard of living to the Chinese people for several decades running. And, while that's a little bit less uh, certain right now and going forward, um, that is the past. And, and that is what people are looking at uh, in China when they're thinking about how they feel about their government by and large. And so I don't know that the distinction uh, is actually as meaningful in practice as it is in terms of the rhetoric. There have been maybe five plus moments during this discussion where I want to do a whole hour <laughs> offshoot. Um, we'll just put that to the side of, I mean, there's a lot to say about uh, the US or Congress's assessments of China, whether that's actually grounded in reality, but we'll just bracket that for now. Um, realizing that we're running, running out of time, um, let's just, we were talking about worst case or sort of something to the left of that. Let's just talk about base case. What is, what is your, prediction thoughts on how things will evolve in terms of firm behavior and investor behavior over the next few years? Do you expect absent, obviously if the big thing happens, that's, that's a one situation, but what, is, what are you actually observing in terms of quote, decoupling or reduced exposures? Like how quickly is this happening? Um, what are the things you look at to make that assessment? From the investor standpoint, I think uh, the process of you know, de-risking 
uh, and pulling back incrementally from China, uh, re reimagining the risks, the real risks that you would face as an investor uh, going into the Chinese markets. I think that process is well underway. Uh, it's, you know, Chinese equities have priced in lots of bad news. Lots of these risks are in the price, all of them. It's hard to make that claim. Our view, uh, and when we talk with our clients about our base case going forward, really is that you know Chinese markets will have these you know up and down moments, but for the most part, this is a kind of a dead money market. Uh, every uh, you know the every time we think that the common <laughs> prosperity process is kind of done with the private sector, something else crops up, another billionaire or someone else kind of you know exits the scene, <laughs> and uh, and it's just this. The direction of travel for U.S.-China relations is not uh, in uh, a positive direction, obviously, for investors. And I think the, you know, the they're going to continue voting with their feet. Uh, the <coughs> continual, you know, the the way that assets perform in China, I think, over the medium to longer term, isn't going to be all that enticing uh, to bring them back on a durable basis either. So, just quick final thoughts. So. I, Emily, I know you've been doing research in more sort of steady state U.S.-China relations, so not the scary thing. What's your basic outlook? So that's exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. I mean, I think when firms firms are going to continue this hedging um, kind of behavior, they want to have resiliency and redundancy as needed, but they also need some guidance from policymakers. What is the end state for our economic engagement with China? What does that look like? What economic activity is permissible and, in fact, encouraged? We've heard that personal care products are okay and chips are not okay. There's a lot of stuff in between that we don't have clarity on, clean energy, biotech. These are really growing important critical markets and we don't know where the lines are and policymakers need to draw those lines and make them clear. The other thing that needs to happen is that we need to make sure that it, it is a allied and partners approach. Um, if we are taking restrictions and drawing lines, it's only going to hurt our own firms if we are the only ones doing it. And that's something we hear consistently um, from the private sector because it is true. Um, and so I think those are the two things that we have in mind. Define the end state, have a vision for how this turbulent period lands, recognizing that we're not going to change China, China's behavior, but we need to find ways to deal with China as an economic actor, as significant as it is, and make sure we're not doing this alone. Good advice. Yeah. Anna, final thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, we see a 50% chance that the guardrails stay on the U.S.-China relationship uh, through the rest of this year. Uh, meaning that you know we continue this gradual worsening of the relationship, a 40% chance that it becomes more precipitous because of a foreseen or un unforeseen um, circumstance. And that 40% chance really means that companies need to be moving faster in de-risking than they are, but they're responding to um, the incentives, the carrots and sticks that, that, that the government and policymakers both here and in China are presenting. Um, and I think that there's a, a risk that, that the U.S. government in particular is too sanguine about the rate of de-risking and how much de-risking has actually happened because uh, they're not thinking about the fact that when companies decide to uh, shift parts of their supply chain out of China to other, other markets, uh, they oftentimes are followed by their Chinese partners, their Chinese manufacturers who are also trying to make sure that they, that they diversify in order to not lose business. Um, so we've got China going out into the world at the same time that these companies need to be going out into the world and those, those supply chain connections may be persistent. Uh, well, I will refrain from asking follow-ups as we are out of time, but thank you all to, for joining us. Thank you to the audience for, for tuning in today. Um, I don't know, Jude, any final thoughts? No, you, you, you take the final benediction. Uh, I mean, look, there's just a lot more research is needed on this. There, there are clearly discussions happening in many companies, as you can all attest. Um, I think the more clarity we can bring in terms of the risks, but also having better perspective of what companies are actually worried about, what their incentives are, and to sort of to, to bridge uh, the, the U.S. government's perspective with the private sector perspective, um, that is much needed and would be great, greatly helpful. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you.